Hello, my name is Bruce Miller, and I'll be speaking about record keeping in Microsoft M365. So I'm with RimTech Consulting. This is my contact information here. And um, I did write a book on managing records in Microsoft SharePoint. So I do watch this very, very, very closely. I spend a great deal of time studying it and also comparing it with uh, third-party plugin products. So that's what this session is about. It's about what is it really like to use M365's native record keeping capabilities. So there are five elements that we need to cover to really get our heads around uh, record keeping capabilities. First of all, where is it? It's not hidden away. It's in this menu option that you see here highlighted in red. It's a records management submenu underneath the compliance main menu in M365. Now, this session refers to uh, Enterprise Level 5, which is the more expensive of the two M365 licenses, M3 or M5, or I think it's called EL, Enterprise License 5 versus EL3. My understanding is that if you have EL3, you can purchase the records and compliance portions and add them to EL3 so that you don't have to upgrade up to EL5. But either way, this session refers to EL5 or EL3 with the upgrade. So here are the five things we're going to cover. Retention policies, retention labels, the file plan, which is what Microsoft calls a retention schedule, disposition at the end of the life cycle, and preservation copies. So we'll cover each of those in some detail. Now, the first thing that you really need to know is um, that Microsoft M365 is not a product. It's a bag of seven products. There's SharePoint, OneDrive, Exchange Email, Exchange Public Folders. There are Groups, Teams, and even Yammer. So there are seven products in this bag or this box, and all seven uh, were built with different design philosophies at different times by different teams. So you got to realize that what, what uh, Microsoft is trying to achieve is difficult. They're trying to achieve consistent record keeping across seven very different products, very different products. So what you'll find is that the ability to do things changes across each of these seven products. It's, it's not as straightforward as you, as you might think. So it's important to keep in mind that you're looking at capabilities across seven different product platforms. And you have to always be aware of what's different in one, one what, which capability is applicable to which product. So now the first thing we're going to tackle is policies versus labels. This is the one thing that you got to know to really understand the difference. Policies are retention rules that apply to places. Labels are retention rules that are applied to things. Microsoft's language is items. What the heck is an item? Well, it depends on the seven products. If it's, um, if it's SharePoint or OneDrive, it's a document. Uh, uh, if it's uh, Microsoft Exchange email, it's a message. If it's Microsoft Teams, it's a message. So either way, uh, just know that policies are applied to places, labels are assigned, to, are assigned to things, and they're hugely different. It's really important to know the difference. If you look at them side by side, they look almost identical. Know also that one of the principles of record keeping is that we have to lock down a record and make it immutable. Uh, we call that declaring it to be a record. That cannot be done via a policy. It has to be done via a label. Okay. So what you see on the screen here in front of you now is uh, a, a high-level description of the differences between the two, but we'll be getting uh, into that in more detail. So look below on the slide, and you'll see that retention labels cannot be applied to public folders in Exchange, Messages in Teams, or Yammer. That's an example of how uh, the capabilities are different depending on what product you apply it to. Now here's a detailed uh, list of the difference in capabilities between a policy and a label. And again, policies for places, labels for things. But what you'll see down here is that um, there's quite a number of features. There looks to be about six to eight 
differences in behavior between what a policy can do and what a label can do. Let's take a look at this one. Retention can be applied manually. In other words, by an end user arbitrarily. Uh, it can be done with a label, but not with a policy. Okay. So uh, this one down here, for example, as well, is persist if the content is moved. What the heck does that mean? Well, that means that uh, if a document has a label assigned to it, and you move the document from one place in uh, SharePoint to another place, or from one drive into SharePoint, or from uh, SharePoint into OneDrive, or vice versa, then the uh, label stays with it, okay? But a policy does not. A policy stays in one place. So when you move a document out of that place, it no longer is under the influence of that policy. Now, this is another really important uh, principle you've got to understand. Uh, it's preservation copies. It's a really important thing to know because it's a strong trend in the market at large now. The whole market for electronic record keeping is kind of tilting this way. And I suspect they're going that way because this is where Microsoft is taking us. So what is a preservation copy? Here's the principle. Um, the, 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 the standard uh, doctrine in re electronic record keeping is lock this doc document down when it's a record and make it immutable. That's a seminal principle of, of, uh, of uh, authenticity. We, we know that nobody could, could uh, muck around with that uh, document, uh, and um, so it can be presented as an authentic record at the end of its life or at any point throughout its life because nobody could, could uh, fool around with it. It's immutable, not changeable. Right, So that's an inconvenience for the user. So what Microsoft thought was, well, rather than inconvenience the users, let them make all the changes they want. But the minute they touch it to change it, we're going to make a copy of it. And that copy is what I call a preservation copy, a PC, preservation copy. It is not a duplicate. It is a replication. A duplicate is an exact copy. Is this an exact copy? Kind of, sort of, but not really. So I'm calling it a replication. And remember, a document in records has two components. It has a content and its associated metadata. And to me, um, a true duplicate duplicates both and never allows a change. That's true duplication. This is not. This is replication of uh, 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 a uh, preservation copy. So look in the middle of the slide here. And what you'll notice is that um, there are three uh, locations that determine how this works, uh, what, what the behavior is. So SharePoint on OneDrive, the preservation copy is in a library called the Preservation Hold Library. In Exchange, it's in a, uh, the preservation copy is a folder, or uh, they're stored in a folder called Recoverable Items. In Teams, there's an exchange folder called recoverable items again. So they're using the same place. So again, if the product is different, then the location for the preservation copies is different. Now, uh, usually, not always, but usually users will not see these preservation copies. They won't know where to find them. They may not, likely won't have any access to them. Uh, and it could be that you pay. Uh, if you have a tenancy uh, um, in a cloud storage from Microsoft, such as Azure, and you're paying for the storage, then you're going to pay for the storage of these preservation copies. And when you do delete something, uh, there's a 30-day grace period after they're deleted. The preservation copy actually hangs around for 30 days in case you made a mistake. So where do they get stored? Well, this is an example from OneDrive where you can see the preservation hold library on the lower right there. Now, what does it mean when something is a preservation copy? Well, it means that it's a copy of the document and a copy of the metadata. Where does it go? It goes to the PHL, the preservation hold library. Again, this is strictly SharePoint and OneDrive. It's not the same in exchange. But as you can see, there's quite a number of characteristics here. Now, when is the copy made? 
The short answer is when the user edits or deletes the document. Okay, that's the very short answer. The very long answer is in front of you on this slide. Any of the actions on the left triggers the uh, a preservation copy on the right. Okay, so quite a lot of uh, consideration there. We, we don't have time to cover them all, nor do we need to. The message is when the user makes a change, that's when, it, when a preservation copy is created. Okay, this is a look uh, at a preservation hold library in SharePoint. So you can see that document highlighted in, uh, in blue is one of, of about, well, it looks like about 15 documents in the hold library. All you see is the name, modified and modified by. There's more to it than that, but that's all we see in this view. Now, um, here's how Microsoft 365 declares a record. When you create a label, you can specify if that label is going to, quote, make the document a record. It's a simple radio push button that we'll see in a few minutes. So, um, and the, the good news is, yeah, you can make it a record. The bad news is users cannot delete the content. In other words, the content or the document itself is immutable, but the um, associated metadata can be edited. That's not good, not good at all. That's actually quite bad. That's not what we wanna see for modern record keeping. It violates our uh, integrity rules and authenticity rules. So, so what you can now do is they have another type of record called a regulatory record. And a regulatory record means that you can, it will lock down and make immutable the content and the metadata, okay? That smells to me like they realized after the fact that, oh, oh, we, maybe we should have done this. So now every time you create a label, you have to specify whether it's a record or a regulatory record. And if you're in a serious record keeping environment, you must always use regulatory record. I, I can't imagine um, not using that, okay? So that's what this table shows. It shows the differences in behavior between a, a regular record and a regulatory record. So we always want regulatory record. Now, the file plan or what, uh, what what we know as um, as a retention schedule. So what is the file plan? The file plan uh, uh, is the retention schedule, or it's an attempt at it. The Really what it is, is it's the full bag of labels. So all the labels you create, the idea, the thinking behind the labels is each label is to be applied, created and applied to documents of a different activity. So if you look on the left side of the screen, you'll see audits and benefit plans. So uh, if uh, um, the idea is that we have audits around here, so let's create a label for all our documents related to audits. We also have benefit plans, so let's create another label. So this is a correlation with a retention schedule. On the left is a business activity, with a, and, and that's the name of the label. So the file plan in M365 is the list of labels. So if you have, I would guess in any modern organization, you probably have up to a thousand unique activities for uh, any reasonably sized uh, operation, then you're gonna have a thousand labels here for sure. You'll actually have more, but a minimum of a thousand. So that's the list of labels right here. And if you look at the column headings from left to right, you'll see uh, uh, the event triggers, uh, is it a record, yes or no, the retention period, the disposition type, how and when it gets destroyed, and a reference ID. Now that reference ID you type in, that's a code that you can assign to a label, okay? Now here are the five elements that we can create for every label in this file plan. A reference ID is, um, is a code of your creation uh, for instance, you can have a three-letter code abbreviation for uh, for financial. You can just call it FIN, and then you can have FIN dash payroll for payroll records. You can have FIN dash uh, auditing for audit records or whatever. You have a, a function, a category. Now the category is the 
real business activity. Subcategory is not really used, it's just carried along for the ride. Authority type and a provision for citation. So this is really lean, but what you need to know is that it's flat, it's not hierarchical. It's just a list, okay? That's all you get. There are no primaries, no secondaries, no tertiaries. You could kind of think of it as hierarchical if you put a dash and a, another code after the reference ID, but it does not have a parent-child relationship. There's no structure behind it that's hierarchical. So this is what it looks like on screen. Not very complicated. You got your code, your title, your category name, and uh, the other uh, fields that you can create there. So let's now look into the labels themselves. So again, keep in the back of your mind that um, each label is an activity in the retention schedule. At least that's the intent, okay? So what do we create here? Well, we can have the retention period and then when, what triggers the retention period. So the, the, the trigger can be um, uh, age, which is um, uh, the document will be destroyed after a certain period of time, or it can be driven by an external event, such as termination of employment or end of contract, something like that. Now, if it's an age-based, then it's calculated differently depending on whether it's from email or in SharePoint slash OneDrive. So if it's in SharePoint, it's triggered by the date created or the date it was last modified. If it's in Exchange, if it's a message in Exchange, then the trigger date can only be the date sent or the date received, that's it. So uh, if you have a PDF from 10 years ago that was stored in SharePoint yesterday, that document is no longer 10 years old, it's one day old. And that's a problem, that's a real issue. So I would love nothing more than to see a true document date or some kind of another date field where you could back date it if necessary. Anyway, so you'll notice on the screen here, highlighted in that red square, you'll see mark items as a record or mark items as a regulatory record. Always pick regulatory record, at least in a robust record keeping environment we will. And you'll notice the last checkbox or radio button is delete items automatically. And that's still part of disposition. You can now do reviews, which we'll get to later, but automatic disposition means that when the time is up, that document is gone. So here's where, what it looks like to uh, display an ordinary list of documents in SharePoint or OneDrive. So the one on the bottom, it's highlighted in red, and you'll see that it's got a label. It is a record, it says yes, and item is a record. It's got a retention label on it, and the date it was assigned. So it's locked, record status is shown as locked. That uh, panel on the right-hand side shows all the details of the document that you're looking at on the screen. And it says it's locked. Now, let's go to the policies. Remember, policies are assigned to places. Labels are applied to things or documents or records. So here's a retention policy. And we can, uh, what, uh, what does this policy get applied to? Well, you can, uh, the policy gets applied to a place such as a library or, or a site in SharePoint. And what documents does it affect? Well, you have to type in a query. And the documents met by that query are the ones that have the um, policy applied to it. So you can type in a phrase in there. It's meant for um, sensitive information, like you see on the screen here, such as social insurance numbers, et cetera, okay? So it has 81 predefined patterns, such as a US taxpayer number or a Canadian social insurance number, what have you, and you can create your own patterns as well. So the intention of that is for sensitive information. Notice that what it's searching for in that query is that content inside the document. So where do we put policies? Well, uh, po uh, retention policies can be applied to folders in Exchange, SharePoint, OneDrive, groups. They can be automatically applied. 
if the query matches the sensitive information. It can be applied to uh, uh, documents inside email exchange, SharePoint, or OneDrive. Okay. All right. Now, uh, again, whenever you apply a policy, you have to ask yourself, where am I going to apply it? So this shows that you can apply it to Exchange, SharePoint, OneDrive, Groups. Uh, this is the slide. It's actually a bit dated. It's also uh, Teams or Exchange. Okay. Now look at the, the box on the right-hand side here. Um, the locations can be applied to uh, the entire product, you know, all of OneDrive, or you can choose accounts inside OneDrive. To, to take that out to uh, Exchange, you can say, I want it to all recipients, or I can specify which recipients I want to apply that to. So again, depending on the product you apply it to, um, the uh, target documents are going to change. Now, I find the retention policies kind of tricky. You've got to watch this very, very, very carefully. So first we're going to look at how do the policies work for SharePoint and OneDrive. It's very different than for Exchange, which we'll get to in a moment. So this is strictly for SharePoint and OneDrive. So you apply a policy to a site in the SharePoint or an account in OneDrive, okay? Now, here's what happens. Let's say you have a, a five-year then delete policy on, uh, on one of these sites or, or one of these accounts. Then uh, the user doesn't know what's going on necessarily, but they go, to, go ahead and they delete a, a document. So what happens in their document library? So what happens is they delete it and then a, the, a copy is placed in a, automatically in the preservation hold library. So they've edited it or deleted it, and they may not be aware of this. I'm actually not sure if they are aware. I don't think they are aware, but a copy is made, and it goes to this preservation hold library. And it'll be kept there for the duration of the retention policy. Okay, And after the policy is up, it's kept for seven days after the policy ends and is deleted. Okay, this is assuming automatic deletion. Now, what happens if the user doesn't delete it or modify it? Then it lives out its full life according to the retention period. So uh, it goes to the first stage recycle bin, and then it sits there uh, <clears throat> for the full uh, remainder of the retention period. After, sorry, after the retention period has expired, then it goes to the first stage recycle bin. And if it's deleted from there, then it's moved to a second stage. A preservation copy is moved to a second stage recycle bin. And there it's kept for the remainder of the retention period plus 93 days. So, uh, and when it's deleted, it's any copies left behind in the first or second stage recycle bins are, is deleted as well. So, that's a little bit complicated, but that's the way it works. Now, it's very different for exchange mailboxes and public folders. So there are three different behaviors uh, that trigger three different um, uh, things here. So first, if, what if the user deletes the, a message? So again, the retention policy is applied a, a retention rule to this folder or this account. Somebody deletes a message. What happens is, the message is moved to the deleted items folder. That, that's the way it's always been and always will be. Second thing, second event, is that the message is now deleted from the deleted items folder, eventually, okay? So if anybody tries to delete it from there, then the message is moved to the recoverable items folder, okay? If the user makes a change to the message, however, in other words, they don't delete it, they just change the metadata on it, then, or they make an edit to the message and save it, uh, then uh, a copy is made. Before they make that change, a copy is made and sent to the recoverable items folder. Okay? What happens in the recoverable items folder? Well, uh, if there's no policy applied to the message, then it'll be permanently deleted. If there is a policy, however, it'll be kept there for the duration of the policy plus 14 days and deleted. 
So what you've got to know here is that in email, an edit creates a preservation copy that lives in the recoverable items folder. An email deletion triggers a move to the recoverable items folder. Okay, very different behaviors there. Now, uh, I'm not going to dwell on this. This is preservation lock. Uh, preservation lock means apply uh, a, a rule to it and don't allow anybody to remove the rule or to change the rule, period. And that's very strong, very uh, unique. The retention on it can actually be increased, but it can never be lowered. And that's for a unique circumstance such as SEC Rule 17A4. Uh, the only person who could possibly delete that uh, document is the same person who could basically wipe out all of SharePoint. Okay, it's a, it's a deep, deep administrative account holder. So that's extreme, and uh, usually you wouldn't do that. Now, this is where, where things get tricky. Um, when, I, when I fully understood this, I thought, holy cow, that's a lot to keep in your head. And it is. I call it ambiguous retention. Remember that there are two species of retention uh, policies and labels you can apply. One is called a deletion policy, and one is called a retention policy. In other words, you can say, on this site in SharePoint, I want to keep documents for five years. That's a rule, uh, or sorry, that's a label, or it's a policy, and that's it. You're done. Fair enough. We're going to keep it for five years. And then you can put a, another rule on it five minutes later that says, no, we're going to delete it after three years. Really? Okay. So it accepts both. Which one wins? So over time, you can have overlapping and competing retention policies. So it's, you've got to keep this straight in your head. And this shows the rules of the game. So um, uh, retention of retention policy always wins over or takes precedence over a deletion policy that's in effect for the same document at the same time. Now, for, uh, delete, for uh, retention labels, there are two ways to assign a, a retention rule in a label. One is explicit, one is implicit. Explicit means the user did it. The user said, I want this one kept for five years. Fair enough. Explicit, or sorry, implicit, means that the administrator, most likely you, had an automatic rule assigned through a policy that said, uh, we're going to keep this stuff for 10 years. Okay, So now we have a, two competing rules, an explicit and an implicit, one for five years, one for 10 years. Which one wins? The one the user assigned. The explicit inclusion will always um, uh, take effect over the explicit, uh, the implicit, sorry. Now, if you have multiple rules that are deletion, in other words, if you have three rules that say delete in three, delete in six, and delete in nine, then the shortest one always wins. Okay? The six and the nine will be ignored, and it'll be deleted in three. Okay? So on the right-hand side of the slide, they have the, uh, these scenarios here. But the way to think of it is if you look at the bottom diagram there, uh, that's my lousy artwork, but that's Venn diagrams. Remember that from high school? Venn diagrams. There's three rules, all impacting one document or set of documents, and the net impact is the overlap between all three. So we have to keep this uh, in our heads somehow. So here's how uh, this diagram does a good job of showing the difference between, or the relationship between uh, policies and labels. Think of a policy as a container of labels. So we got two boxes here, label policy A and label policy B. Policy A contains labels one and three. Label policy B contains labels four, three, and five. So label three is used in both policies. Nothing against that. That's just fine. So you assign the you notice in the diagram that the policies are assigned to the places on the right. I'm only showing four, Exchange, SharePoint, OneDrive, and uh, groups. But the whole entirety of the label is 
assigned to what Microsoft calls published to the location on the right. So policy A is, has been published to Exchange and it contains labels one and three. So labels one and three are available in Exchange for the users to use or for you, the administrator, to assign um, uh, automatically. They're available. That's what publish means. Make them available in that location exchange, okay? Similarly, in policy B, uh, that container has three labels in it and they're available in SharePoint and OneDrive, okay? So on the right, let's take a quick look at these rules here. Um, publishing means make it available or assigning it to one or more locations. Uh, content, which means the documents within one of their products can have um, only one label at one time, okay? Now, labels can be assigned in one of two ways, either by the user directly, that's explicit, or you can assign it through an automatic assignment rule, okay? Uh, a user can remove or alter any label that has been assigned manually. In other words, user uh, explicitly assigned. Now, a user, if they don't like the auto-assigned label that you applied, they can replace it with a manual one, okay? Reverse is not true. An automatic label that you assign cannot replace the manually assigned label. It doesn't work in the other direction. But the tricky part is that it's possible for multiple rules to take effect at the same time. So manually assigned label takes precedence over automatically assigned, which we mentioned before. So again, uh, this is very flexible, but it's up to you to keep track of this and we'll make sure that we know what we're doing and that uh, at all times you should be able to, to, to have a strong awareness of what's going on in the documents in that location. Here's what a label policy looks like, a retention label. So in this example, we're going to retain the content for seven years and we're not going to delete it. It's a no selected there, right? And what does that mean? It means it's basically permanent re retention. It's called a retention rule. And if I had clicked yes and said, do you want to delete it after this period, it was, it's now a deletion rule, right? So there are three ways to calculate the age of that document. I covered this before briefly. Uh, the create date, the last modified date, and the date labeled. Uh, so that is fine usually, but if you have an environment where you're bringing in older documents that you downloaded or, or bringing them in through a migration or something, then it would be really helpful to have a, a fourth way to compute the age, which is true age of the document, true document date. Now, this is what it looks like to... Uh, 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 classify a document here, a few more rules. So when you assign a label to a document, a label, if you recall, is a, um, a rule, an activity with a retention rule on it. So that's what Microsoft calls classifying. It's a good old fashioned language of uh, uh, taking a document and classifying it against the retention schedule, right? So if you, if you choose to classify it as a record, then the content cannot be deleted or edited. And the label cannot be removed. But the metadata can be edited. So that's why we want to use regulatory record, not regular record, okay? And for SharePoint, a few more rules here. For SharePoint and OneDrive, uh, the only, only the site administrator can assign that type of a label. So if you create a label and you say, this label is going to make it a record, and the user cannot assign it. You have to assign it, okay? So again, for Exchange Gmail, uh, the label cannot be assigned to a message. It can be assigned to a folder, which I presume, I haven't tested this, but I presume it then affects all the messages in that label. Uh, I'm sorry, inside that folder, okay? So again, uh, conceptually here, you have to keep straight in your head um, well, how is the behavior of this different in each of the products? This is what it looks like to assign um, uh, a label to an email on the upper right here. 
and to a document in SharePoint on the lower left. Now, this is what it's like to do it manually. Uh, the administrator, that's you, you create the label and you publish it or assign it to uh, a location, a SharePoint site or what have you. Then the user, uh, when they're working on that document, the label is now available to them. So they can assign the label to that document if they wish. And then this, uh, this software M365 enforces that rule. Okay. Look at the right. On the right is a drop down list of all the labels. So again, if you have a thousand different activities, you got a thousand in that list. The user has to select it if they're doing manual label assignment. This is what it looks like in SharePoint. So again, it's the same drop-down list. This takes a little more screen real estate, but keep in mind that A, this is um, a label being assigned that is not a record, because users can't assign record labels. And uh, the, they had to select from all of the labels available, okay? Now, if you do it automatically, then you're, this is what we call automatic auto-apply label. Uh, then you are creating a label that, that will be applied to all the documents that match a specified condition, okay? And again, it's going to look inside the content for the condition to be met. And there's a time delay. It can take up to a week for these to take effect. Uh, it takes up to a week in, in, uh, in uh, Exchange and one day within SharePoint, so there's a bit of a time delay. So again, I think this is more focused uh, on GDPR than it is on records keeping, but nonetheless, again, you create a query that says, I'm looking for patterns that meet this pattern, such as a social insurance number or passport number, what have you, inside the document. And the, the policy will be, a, the label will be assigned based on documents that meet that particular pattern inside the document. Here we can show uh, the, the degree of confidence that the um, policy has to have before it assigns the label. So it's variable. You know, if you see this social insurance number 13 times, you're quite certain that it's there. So you're going to give it a, a, a go. So you can specify how accurate it has to be before it's matched. KQL, keyword query language. Very, very simplistic. Um, you need to learn that uh, to specify what you're looking for inside the documents. You don't need any programming uh, knowledge to do that. This, is, this screen capture shows what it's like to assign a label via a, uh, an email rule, an email action rule. So you could say all emails from this source with this email address uh, would have this label applied to it. Very handy, very handy. Now, this is what the deletion part of a policy or rule looks like. So here we have uh, a name and a delete action. Permanently delete or delete it via the recycle bin. And again, the date can be those three dates, last modified date, date the label was applied, or uh, what was the third one? I forget the third one right now. Last modify, date label was assigned, or, oh yes, it was a date it was loaded into the system date. It was what they call create date. To Microsoft, create date is a date it was stored in this product. So again, if you're taking a 10-year-old document and storing it in the, one of these products, then it's a day old, right? So in the lower right here, you can see that uh, you can have templates and assign to OneDrive for business template. So uh, that's very, very helpful. You can, uh, I think that this is best for what I call cleanup as opposed to disposition. To me, these deletion policies are blunt instruments, very blunt, very strong. And you can say everything in this site uh, goes away at this particular time. Okay, So it's great for mass deletion, which I call cleanup but it's ignoring the retention schedule, at least the way that we're doing it here. Now, trainable classifiers. This is brand new. Uh, uh, I don't think it's been market tested yet, but it certainly is pretty new. What is a trainable classifier? A trainable classifier, think of it as a pattern, okay? 
to me, uh, um, what we want to do is we want to say, of the million documents we have in SharePoint and OneDrive, um, which are the documents that are contracts that I want to apply a contract rule to, okay? Now, how do I tell what a contract is? Well, you create a pattern, and a pattern you can call it, give it a name, call it contract, simple as that. And what is the text that I'm looking for inside that document that convinces me that this, this is actually about a contract? Well, you'll be able to specify that. I can't show you a screen of it because I haven't even seen the screen yet. It's too new. But each trainable classifier is one pattern, one search pattern. And it uses its new Cortex AI artificial intelligence engine to, to work on that pattern and come back with all the documents that need it. How do you make that happen? Well, you train the classifier. So you say, here's my pattern, and here are three sample documents. These documents are good examples of this contract. So, uh, and here's a document that is a poor example, so not a contract. Feed all four to the, to the AI Cortex engine, and it does its magic and comes back and says, okay, I'm ready. Now I can tell the good ones from the bad ones, okay? Which ones are contracts and which ones are not. So if you look at the examples here, they have examples of resumes, source code, harassment, profanity. That wouldn't be too hard to do. So um, uh, you've got to create these, okay? Now, uh, so that's another way to select documents so that you don't have to write a keyword query, uh, uh, um, but uh, it, you're going to assign a label based on what the uh, classifier comes up with, okay? Now, this is a different topic altogether. This is record versioning. What this means is what happens when I lock a document, it's locked down, uh, and we're using version tracking, but I realize, oh, we're still making changes. I didn't expect that. Well, it turns out you can unlock it. So it's very tricky. Um, this only works when you have versioning, and I mean Microsoft SharePoint versioning turned on. So this is an example. If you look on the right-hand side of the screen, You'll see record status in the middle. It says locked. And the arrow shows what happens when you unlock it. Okay? That allows you to continue modifying the document. So it's shown on the right in that panel over there, on the lower right. It says record status now unlocked. But it's still a record. As you can see in the retention label, item is a record says yes. Okay? So here it is. It's a record, but we're modifying it. So what goes on behind the scenes? Well, it makes a duplicate of that version, and it calls, and it's a record duplicate of that version. These are the exact precise rules. We're not going to take the time to cover them all, but uh, quite a bit there. But it does allow you to unlock and relock. The good news is that if that happens, it's fully recorded in the audit trail. So we know that someone has been mucking around with that uh, document. Now, we're only five minutes away from finish here, so we're going to uh, tackle one of the trickiest things of all, which is event-driven retention. So here we have, we have three labels, and we want to have a retention rule that says, when this product reaches the end of its life, we want to uh, trigger the retention rule. And we have two types of records, Word documents and email messages, which you can see from the icon. So we're going after asset ID ABC. Now, what you got to know is that how do you number documents? How do you identify documents? We're about to find out. If it's in uh, SharePoint or OneDrive, you, the documents have to have an asset ID. If it's in Exchange, it has to have a keyword. Keyword. Okay. So we want to produce a rule that says um, delete documents where the product reaches its end of life. That's going to be the trigger for the retention period. So we're going to create a label with an event-based retention period on it. So here's what we had to do first. We had to create asset ID. So if you have a thousand products and hundreds of thousands of documents about those products, then you've got to assign a product code for each unique product. If you have a hundred projects, you have to create a hundred project codes. If you have a thousand employees and you have records related to the employees, you have to create a thousand employee IDs. So they call that asset IDs. On the right, you can see that the user types in an asset ID. 
bad idea because how often are we going to create uh, get the name or the employee ID correct all the time? This should and must be a drop down list, but it's not. So here we're going to go into the events section and create an event type. We're going to do event settings. Now we can do this in two ways. On the left, we can use PowerShell, which is custom programming in SharePoint. That's the best way to do it, actually. We're going to do it manually on the right. It'll take us 11 steps. We, we can create keyword for the item. I'm calling it vehicle 707 in our fleet. We have to create an asset ID for SharePoint and OneDrive called vehicle 707 and a keyword for exchange called vehicle 707. Okay. And when did vehicle 707 reach the end of its life? You can see on the bottom there, it said, when did this event occur? That's where we type in the end of the vehicle's life. So we want a retention label that says status is final and the document type is product specification. That's the example that Microsoft is working with here. Now, step one, we have to uh, find and identify those documents. So we go into crawled properties, status. Crawled property is going to yield OWS underscore status and that long one that ends in doc type. I don't know how exactly it works, but those two strings are telling us that these are the proper internal property names of status and doc type. Okay. Now we have to find a container for those two strings. They're called refinable strings. We have to find empty refinable strings uh, or what they refer to as managed properties. Okay. And then we have to map our two uh, status and doc type internal field names to those refinable strings. So here we do the first one. And now on the bottom right, we've now mapped the two empty refinable strings, 00 and 01, to doc type and status. Okay. Now here, uh, we're going to apply a label to, to those documents. So if you look at the middle radio button, we're going to apply a label that contains specific words or phrases or properties. So we want refinable string 00, uh, product specification must equal product spec, and the refinable string 01, which contains the field final, must contain the phrase final. Okay, so now this label will only go on documents that contain status as final and doc type equals product spec. Here we choose where. In this case, we're going to go only to SharePoint. Now we're at step nine, believe it or not. We got to wait seven days to see if this actually worked. And we should check it and make sure it worked. So what we do is we do a search for all documents uh, that are meeting this retention label. And uh, uh, there should be, the label should be applied only where doc type contains product specification status equals final. So again, we set the event date at the bottom of the screen here. So that's what it's like to produce an event-based retention. A lot of steps, a lot of technology involved there. You've got to really dig into the internal workings of uh, SharePoint and M365. So now we're at the end of the life cycle disposition. So we have, uh, here we have uh, a list of uh, documents that are uh, eligible for destruction. We're going, to we're going to specify that we want them to be reviewed for approval. So this is what the list looks like. Each row is a document name and the, and the number of uh, items that, can, that meet that particular label rule. So here we can pick reviewers. Reviewers are coming from Active Directory. These are uh, uh, SharePoint M365 users. And the notifications are sent out once a week. I don't think you can control that. I, I'm not. 100% certain, but I think that's a fixed thing. At the end of the life cycle, there's three things the reviewer can specify, dispose, extend, or tag, which means get rid of it, extend it, or switch labels and make it a different label. So the purchase orders here, 
you can see purchase orders. So these on the left are your labels, and on the right is the number of documents that meet the requirements of that label. So these are my conclusions. Uh, first of all, this entire uh, suite of capabilities is only limited to what to the records inside Microsoft 365. Does Microsoft 365 do records? Yes, it does. Are you prepared? The bigger question is, are you prepared to deal with what you just saw? Uh, if you're, I think the answer would be sure if what you're doing is simplistic. If it's robust and sophisticated, probably not. Uh, there is no physical records management. Uh, the file plan is flat, not hierarchical. We have ambiguous retention, which is overlapping retention. You've got to figure out a way to keep that in your head. Uh, this business of creating cases is very complicated. I found it very complicated uh, to enter all those event dates, 11 steps. Uh, policies and labels, I think they're, they're good, but uh, it shouldn't be necessary to have uh, uh, record and regulatory record. And I think that was just Microsoft realizing that they had to get this right. That's uncomfortable to have two levels of record. And the disposition, did you know that um, when the end of the life cycle is reached, the records are still kept for seven more years, then they're deleted? And there's a limit of a million records. So uh, there's no disposition certificates, it's a single stage only. There's no transfer to an archive at the end of it. So the disposition is really, uh, you know, here's the document, get rid of it. That's it. Uh, that is pretty much limited to that. So my conclusion is this, is if your requirement is simplistic and you can handle the uh, labeling, uh, the overlap, and the behaviors and conditions and limitations, then you're good to go with M365. But if you are more sophisticated than that, then I think there's still a very strong case for a third-party records keeping software product. Not the least of which is those products these days manage more than just the Microsoft 365 ecosystem. Thank you very much.